you want to turn there, and we'll sing No Not One. No Not One. My, it's good to see all of you here tonight. Let's sing No Not One. All right. There's not a friend like the Holy Jesus. No. that song's true there's not a one like the lowly jesus i'm glad he is in all knowledge of what we go through i'm glad there's not another one like him so good to be in the house of the lord tonight good to see all of you i'm so glad you made it you had a good day amen good good i trust you have and uh, i'm glad the lord's watched over us all of us you and us and took care of us and brought us here to the house of God. Good to see Brother Barry Peppers, our associational missionary. I'm still going to always call him our associational missionary. He, he's got a very distinct uh, title now, but uh, he's always our associational missionary. I, I just call him my friend. That's what I call him, and I'm thankful he is uh, my friend. I'm going to ask him to lead us to the Lord in prayer, and uh, we'll look into the Word of God and... Uh, Ask the Lord to help us tonight. Let's pray. Brother Barry. <coughs> Heavenly Father, we do thank you for this time that we come together together, that we can sing praises and just uh, focus our minds on you. Put our praise to you and open our eyes to see you, our ears to hear you, and our hearts to respond to your word tonight. Give it to us. Father, I thank you for your own, and I thank you, Father, for my life. Just the, the family. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Brother Barry. That's our heart's desire, too. Be changed, conform to the image of the dear Son of God. I I tell you, I'm grateful and thankful for all of God's blessings. I was thinking about that song earlier uh, when I was reminded uh, Sister Jennifer wouldn't be here tonight. School has started back officially at Trine. I was up there this morning uh, for the prayer walk, and uh, thank God for all of the uh, people that was there for the prayer walk this morning. Had a glorious time up there walking with them and praying. 
And I was thinking earlier this week that reminded me of that song, songwriter that wrote that song, also wrote uh, 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 Count Your Many Blessings, Name Them One by One. And I was thinking about that this week of counting our blessings, and I thought about no, not one. Thank God. Well, if you have your Bibles, open them to the book of James. We've been in the book of James for several weeks. Brother, Brother Rick, Ricky Harris filled in for us last week as we were taking a week off and, and uh, spending it uh, with a grandkid and uh, spending some time with, with him. And uh, Sister Karen was spending some time away as well. And uh, thank God for uh, Brother Ricky being here and preaching what a marvelous message and I thank God for him amen James chapter number three is where we're going to be tonight James chapter number three we have made it to chapter number three we started this study several weeks ago and looking at the book of James looking at each verse looking at each section of the book of James James is a very practical book half-brother of our Lord Jesus Christ, and of course, uh, God using him tremendously to write to us and just bringing out very practical things concerning life and faith, how it works in our lives. We started looking at, of course, uh, faith, real faith, and how it really works. Real faith really works. It really does. If you have real faith, it'll really work in your life. We started looking at chapter number one, and what problems do in our lives. We talked about how faith really works in our lives and, and uh, the very fact that the early church, as he's writing to them on the inspiration of the Holy Spirit in chapter number one, he's writing to, ch to a church that uh, are the saints of God, the Jews, and of course to all those that are scattered abroad that are suffering persecution. And I'm thankful. Sometimes you and I go through some hard times and how the word of God comes alive to us wherever we are. He talks about the problems in our lives and how the problems, uh, how God uses that to bring forth the faith in our lives. He talks about problems, problems refine our faith and problems cause us to rely on God and problems refocus our priorities and problems, of course, result in rewards in our lives. All that's right there in the first part of chapter number one. Somebody said it, and I put it in the PowerPoint. Problems make us better people or bitter people. Has a way of driving us to God or driving us away from God. How we ought to let faith drive us to God. Looked in chapter number one and uh, continued there in verse number 13 down through verse number 18. We talked about turning down temptation. There were several things there in learning how to deal with temptation. We looked at how temptation would develop itself. I'm not going to go through every one of these slides. We'll be here half the night. But you can go back and look online and look at that study in turning down temptation. Then we got to the last part of that chapter. We talked about gaining from God's word. How do we gain from God's word? We talked about hearing and uh, receiving and, of course, putting the word of God into practice in our lives. We got to chapter number two and how James deals with favoritism, real faith without favoritism. We're subject to favoritism if we're not careful. The first 13 verses, he deals with that in chapter number two. And then, of course, the last time we were together, we were in the last part of chapter number two, and we talked about how real faith works in the way we live. In our daily lives, we talked about the real faith. It talks the talk. It talks it, and it walks the walk. Not just talk, but walks the walk. Easy. Talk is cheap. We talked about that. And then we talked about it feels. It's more than just a feeling. It feels, but it heals. It's not just a feel, but it's a heal. How the, the real faith, of course, comes along, and it helps in the situations it has a feeling and a heart for helping people and bringing healing. That's what real faith does. And then we talked about faith does more than just believe. It receives and repents. It has action to it. Real faith does. And then we talked about the real faith. It shows in works. It shows forth in 
real works. If something happens in a person's life that has truly trusted the Lord Jesus Christ as his personal Savior in the last part of chapter number 2. Now tonight we come to chapter number 3. And here James is, of course, still dealing with real faith and how it works in our lives. And he's going to deal with probably one of the most difficult things that, well, yeah, I might as well go ahead and say it. Uh, we've got some good people here tonight that don't have as, as great a problem. I started to say don't have a problem with this, but everybody has a problem with this. We just might as well be honest. But you don't have as big a problem with it as other people have with it. But how we ought to properly use the tongue. Now, I start to say some people don't have a problem with this, but everybody has a problem with this. Some people have learned better how to use the tongue than others. Amen. I'll go ahead and say amen right there. You, you ever thought much about the tongue? It's really a small slab of muscle in your mouth. What it really is. Okay, I'll go ahead and say it that way. It, it enables us to taste, to chew, to talk, to swallow. Very powerful thing in our mouth. I'll say some more about that next week. This is probably just going to be the first part of this chapter. But he deals with the tongue so much in this chapter. But our tongue can also be hurtful and harmful. He talks about it in this chapter. If you hit your thumb with a hammer, <laughs> first thing you do is throw it in your mouth, of course. <laughs> but, but you let someone hurt your feelings. It's amazing what happens, isn't it? Slippery, slimy little creature in your mouth suddenly uh, boy, I'm telling you, it shows the bad side of your nature. It's worse than hitting your thumb with a hammer. And that, that's why we need to, James started back there in chapter number one when he said, if any among you seem to be religious and bridleth not his tongue. I, I need this as much as anybody tonight. Chapter number three is a reminder uh, to help us properly use our tongue. Our tongue's have tremendous power. They can be so helpful. Uh, the Bible talks about uh, the words that we say. Uh, word fitly spoken, Solomon said. Fitly spoken. You, you ever notice how you use those words? Of, a word fitly spoken. I pray for, Lord, give me the right words to say to people, especially if I'm going to go try to encourage them or try to help them. Uh, man, I'm telling you, you, you want to say the right things, and you want to say it properly, and you want to say it fittingly. The word properly said, fitly spoken, are like apples of gold and pictures of silver. I mean, it's amazing. The power to help is in the power of the tongue, or the power to hurt. Oh, my. I've said things wanting to be helpful, but they were taken wrong, and they were so hurtful. Ever done that? And to understand some principles in this pa passage, of course, of helping to properly use the tongue or to tame our tongues, there's some things, of course, that we're going to see tonight. I want to read these first five verses. If you're able and can, stand with me. We'll read these first five verses, and then we'll dive right in. I'll cover them right quickly, and we'll talk about the proper use of the tongue. James here talks about it. James chapter 3, verse number 1. My brethren, be not many masters, knowing that we shall receive the greater condemnation. For in many things we offend all. If any man offend not in word, the same is a perfect man, and able also to bridle the whole body. Behold, we put bits in the horses' mouths, that they may obey us, and we turn about the whole body. Now look at verse 4. Behold, also the ships, which though they be so great, and are driven of fierce winds, yet are they turned about with a very small helm, whithersoever the governor listed. Even so the tongue is a little member, and boasteth great things. Behold, how a great manner a little fire kindleth. You can be seated. I want to look at these verses, 
and talk about the proper use or how to proper the proper use of the tongue, properly use in our tongues. James here talks about it, and, and he's going to deal with uh, just two or three things in these first five verses. We'll look at the rest of this, uh, the rest of the part of this chapter that he deals with in the tongue. Uh, maybe next week we'll go a little further, and he as he deals with the tongue and talking about the tongue next week, but also. We'll look tonight in the proper use of the tongue. He, he says here in the first part of this chapter, the first few verses, he says the proper use of the tongue, we should use the tongue generously. Generously or unselfishly, givingly. You know, you and I have that power to give with our tongue. And sometimes that's worth more than money. It's worth more than treasures we can give. You, you, can't, uh, you can't give in money what you can give in hope or encouragement to someone. I, I've, I've noticed that with people. I've, I've noticed people down and out or noticed people in despair or who have given up on life. And, and honestly, it didn't matter what you try to give them or try to show them or try to... Uh, I guess uh, cast to them in a vision of if they're in despair, but if you have words, the proper words are the right questions to get their mind off of where they are in despair, to lift them up to the mountain for them to see with hope once again. It's amazing what happens. James here is addressing some of this. He begins, uh, of course, to talk to teachers of course he's talking about those who instruct are getting us to see the power of all of us as teachers you have an influence on somebody's life you may not see it that way but you do everybody is being watched by someone i, I fail to realize that so many times in my life and to realize that uh when i'm down <laughs> It's not good, but I go through the valley just like everybody else and how it affects other people when I get down. But uh, and, and maybe when I'm in deep thought and I carry that with me somewhere out in public and I'm carrying a burden of someone else and how I need to just uh, put that aside when I go out in public, of course. But James here says it in verse number one, my brethren, be not many masters. That word master uh, literally, it refers to instructors or schoolmasters. He's writing that we should not rush to be teachers, although we are in some way of teacher to someone. But the natural tendency is, of course, to realize that position, but not to, uh, not to go in, in a haughty spirit or uh, seek that position. The, the Jews, the highest calling or most respectable position was the rabbi or teacher. Jesus talked about it in Matthew chapter 23. Go back and read that chapter. The beginning of that chapter, the Bible says, Then spake Jesus to the multitude and to his disciples. And he starts talking about the Pharisees. And uh, he says, The scribes the, and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. And he starts uh, showing them an analogy of how they want that position, but yet they use it so frivolously. He said, All therefore... Whatsoever they bid you observe, that observe and do, but do not ye after their works. For they say and do not. They talk, but they don't do. For they bind heavy burdens and grievous to the born, born to be born, and lay upon men's shoulders, but they themselves will not move them with one of their fingers. And then in verse 6 of that chapter, he says, and the love the uttermost rooms at feast and chief seats in synagogues. And they greet the greetings in the markets to be called of men, rabbi, rabbi. They want the respect. And since teachers primarily teach through verbal communication, especially in Jesus' day too, it's vital that they control their tongues. Sometimes teachers promote their own agendas and uh, they, they want to come across, of course, so strongly that instead of promoting good things, they actually promote chaos. 
We're seeing that much in our society. And disputes and fractions, and sometimes that, that can even happen in churches. Come across with their own ideas and come across with their own philosophies. And they disrupt and sow discord. The Bible is strong against sowing discord, especially among the brethren. The Bible talks against, against it. Spiritual teachers always teach things that promote harmony and coming together, working together, unity. The Bible speaks so much about unity. You see, the Bible reminds us, 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse number 8, finally, be ye all of one mind, having compassion one of another. Love as brethren, be pitiful, be courteous. And James warns about those who are uh, seeking a teaching position for ambition. They, they want to be somebody. Uh, he said they will receive greater condemnation, he says there in verse number one. He, he said they'll receive greater condemnation. He means there's a stricter judgment. Why? Because they're leading people. They'll lead people astray. We've seen that in our own modern day society. I think about Jim Jones and others who've led people astray. They start out teaching the Bible, and then they get off and do away with the Bible. The teaching of the Bible go their own way. And... Uh, Boy, I'm telling you, it's, it's awful, some of the groups that have followed them. Uh, being a teacher can bring judgment if they seek their own self-ambition, their own personal agenda. And, and, of course, teachers have to be careful about that because of the greater judgment, uh, the influence and the role of a teacher. And, and of course, the Bible talks about the, there, there's going to be an influence and a judgment upon us. Jesus talked about that, Luke chapter 12. He said there's an increased influence means increased accountability. Luke chapter 12, verse number 48, in the middle of that verse, he says, For unto whomsoever much is given of him shall be much required. James is not discouraging us to be teachers. Like I said earlier, we're all teachers to some degree. We have to realize someone's watching our lives but the greater responsibility, the potential problems that accompany teaching, he, he's talking about realize the, uh, re, re, uh, the accountability of that. That's the reason Paul talked about the bishops or the pastors are not to be a novice. We can be lifted up with pride and immaturity that goes with that. Sometimes people want to be teachers put in the spotlight but they don't have the, uh, the teaching, the training. We have to be careful to disciple them. Brother Ricky preached on some of that last week, and he talked about that. So we want to use our tongue properly to, to, to build up people in the right way, not in the wrong way, to bring them up right, properly. So we should use our tongues generously to improve people and realize that we promote people in the right way, in the godly way. Instruct them in godly things. Teach them in the right ways. Instruct them in the proper things. Encourage them in the good things. And then he talks about the second thing we should do here. He said we should use our tongues gently. Oh me. I have to say oh me. Say amen or oh me. When I'm guilty, I have to say oh me. I've been guilty of not using my tongue gently. He's referring to our tongues, for in many things we offend all. You notice what he said there? He's been guilty there. Offend means to trip. Hmm. You trip people. Hmm. Oh, me. It's a synonym for sin. We all sin with our tongues. Oh, me. I'll say it. You don't have to. I'll say it. Someone said, the quickest way to cut your own throat is with a sharp tongue. Got my tie in the right place so you can't see the scars. I've cut my own throat with my own tongue. Huh? How many ways can you sin with your tongue? You think, I'll talk. Okay? Gossip. Hurtful things. That's just two. Lie. We all know that one. Deceitful, being deceitful. That's like lying, but it's a little different. Hmm? 
It's not a direct lie. It's just being deceitful, not telling the whole truth. <laughs> being disruptive. Oh, my. Discourage. Discourage people. Oh, Lord, help me. I could go on and on, but I'm not. Those are not. Uh, just looking for the right word here. Those are not uh, helpful, encouraging words. But they are truthful, so I have to say them. But according to Exodus, of course, one of the most serious sins we can commit with our tongues is what? Taking the Lord's name in vain. And that's just not being blasphemous or cursing. Sometimes it's just blatantly calling out to God when we're not even thinking of God. When we're not even in reverence of God. We see that so much in our society now. You notice that? I've noticed that with people. They just haphazardly use God's name. Where'd they get that? Well, off of TV and the society around them. Everybody uses it. And the other people that do use it blatantly and cursing, they've hung around them so long without correcting them. Now, I, I try to make it a habit. I hear someone curse. I say, oh, is he your father? Oh, you know Jesus? And they say, oh, Jesus. Oh, is he? You know Jesus? Bring it to their attention. He is reverent. He is worthy of us not allowing that to go on without respect. There was a saying back in World War II. I, I don't know if you, well, most of you, uh, way before your time. <clears throat> they had a saying back in World War II because uh, they, they would send out uh, commands and uh, plans and different things because things would move in World War II. But they had a saying that said, went like this, loose lips sink ships. And that saying continued even after World War II because of the seriousness and the truth of those words loose lips sink ships loose lips also destroy lives uh, malicious talk or gossip when it's repeated sometimes there are things that are not uh, you know we think of gossip as false things but sometimes even truthful things that are repeated that don't need to be repeated my pastor used to say, if you talk over three minutes on the phone, you're probably gossiping. <laughs> That's what he used to say. Now, I've talked many times, much longer than that on the phone, but I didn't gossip. Uh, of course, I have talked to people on the phone much longer than that, and they were gossiping. Because <laughs> they start talking about everybody else. It doesn't matter if the information is true or not. Sometimes you're sharing things that probably don't need to be shared. True? True. <clears throat> Amen. It's not the slimy gossip that destroys the reputation, you know, or lies. Sometimes it's the truthful things that uh, don't need to be repeated, don't need to be carried on. And the Bible talks about that. Many Christians spend hours each week on the telephone or other things other places talking and destroying other brothers and sisters the bible talks about it proverbs chapter 18 verse number 21 look at that verse death and life are in the power of the tongue do you see that death and life are in the power of the tongue and they that love it shall eat the fruit thereof death and life now notice that i want you to notice that verse we ought to memorize that verse. We ought to have that verse. And we ought to be reminded of that verse because you have the power of both. That's the reason that the tongue ought to be used gently. You can use that tongue to destroy, but you can also use it to add, give life, build up. Take that person that's trying to destroy someone, you can turn that around. Oh. The fellow that married my wife and I, I'll never forget this illustration, I guess as long as I live, because he was such a gentle soul. I guess that's one of the reasons we picked him to marry us. We, we didn't know him as personally as my dad did. My dad went to the Holy Land with him, preached for us several times, and I just loved him. He was a great guy to be around. He was always encouraging. Guy Rainwater was his name. 
He was pastor of the Eastside Baptist Church in Atlanta for years and years and years, and always a blessing to be around, always an encouragement. Him and Miss Lucy was his wife's name, sweet soul. And they told the illustration of someone who came into his office was going to run somebody down. He told two different illustrations. He was out somewhere with uh, some preachers, and they started talking about another preacher. And they started talking about this preacher, and he said, Now, wait a minute, fellas, y'all talking about a friend of mine. And they stopped didn't say nothing else about it. Another occasion, he's in his office, and uh, somebody come in and start talking about somebody else. And Brother Guy just reached over and got a piece of paper out of his, uh, opened his drawer, got out a piece of paper and set it down, reached in his pocket, pulled out his pen, and started writing. And the person said, what are you doing? He said, well, I'm making notes. He said, certainly if you're going to say all this about the person, I want them to know what you're saying. Oh, no, 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 I don't want you to tell. Well, certainly, if you're going to say all of that. They're a friend of mine. I want them to know what you're saying about them. It's like you're a friend of mine. I would want them to, want you to know if they were talking about you. We love each other around here. He told them. Never forgot that illustration about Guy. Such a great, great preacher. He said, no wonder God talks about our tongues where we could bite them and stop that sometime or we can say the right things and build someone up. An untamed tongue, of course, can cause us to sin in many things, James says here in verse number two. Many things. If any man offend not in word, the same is a what? Perfect man. Now he's not talking about one without sin, but he's talking about one that is mature, complete in character. As a matter of fact, he goes on to say he's able to bridle the whole body, the, the ability to control the tongue is a sign of spiritual maturity. Oh, my, boy. I think I just need to quit here and say amen or give an off call or something. But he says here to bridle the entire body. Bridle, of course, he's using the analogy, and he's going to talk about it in the next point, which brings me to the final point tonight. Somebody say amen right there because, boy, this is getting deep, isn't it? He says we should use our tongues graciously, and that's verses 3 through 5, graciously, uh, goodly, or godly, and graciously, beneficially. He, he says, behold, we put bits in the horses' mouths that they may obey us, and we turn about their whole body. Now, James here is going to talk about horses' mouths. He's going to talk about ships, ships, not boats, ships. And he talks about bits and rudders have the same thing in common. You know what it is? The same thing in common. They give direction to something that is so much larger than they are. A bit's just a little bitty thing. A rudder, comparison to that ship, is just a little bitty thing. But yet it gives such great direction to something that is so much bigger than it is. And behold, we put bits in the horses' mouths that they may obey us. We turn their whole body. Years ago, I used to ride horses. Uh, Dad bought us a little Shetland pony when we were just boys, just boys living at home. Uh, I mean, in elementary school. And then uh, when I got in middle school, uh, we moved to Carroll County. I had some boys I played football with, and they had uh, horses. They had horses, quarter horses and Appaloosa horse and when I was there, we, we, I learned more about horses there. We, we broke that little Shetland pony my brother did. That thing would bite the fire out of you. But when we got rid of that thing, man, you could run, jump on his back and everything else. I mean, he was gentle. Them Smith boys done a number on that little Shetland pony. But when I got in middle school, we had quarter horses. That, that my friends had quarter horses and Appaloosa horse. And I learned more about horses and working with horses and learned to break horses and that kind of stuff working with them boys and Norman boys, and uh, it, it was amazing. I learned how to put uh, bridles on them, saddles on them, and all those other things. Uh, and I learned to ride horses with those boys. And, and those, uh, each one of those horses used, uh, they were roughly a half a ton, you know, uh, full of muscle and power. Amazing how those horses could run. 
and, and all that power and all that muscle and all that might and weight was worthless until you put a bridle on them out. You put that bit in their mouth. Oh, it's amazing what you could do with that animal. Oh, it's amazing what you get out of that animal. And you can control the whole the whole body of that horse. You can do, make it do whatever with that that thing in its mouth. Now we don't pass out we don't pass out bridles in our church. There was a time here we probably should have, but we did, we we don't have. <laughs> I'm not going to go there. Look at this verse, Psalms chapter thirty-two, and verse number nine. He talks about this verse. You probably hadn't read this verse a long time in your Bible, but it's there. Look at it. He said, Be ye not as the horse or as the mule, which have no understanding, whose mouth must be held in with bit and bridle, lest they come near unto thee. You, you ain't read that verse a long time, have you? And especially compared to James chapter number 3, but he says it there. The nature of a horse is to run away from you. The nature of a mule is not to move. Stubborn is old mule. And boy, they get that stubbornness, man. I, I've seen, I've literally seen guys whoop mules, take a, take a leather strap, snap a mule, and he just stand there and look at them. <laughs> He's stubborn. He ain't going to move. He got it set. He ain't going to move. I've seen them sit down <laughs> rather than move. I have. It's amazing. He, he doesn't want to take that bridle. I've seen horses. Throw their heads back. No, they don't want to take that bridle. But it's amazing. Once you got that bridle on their mouth, there's a whole different creature. A whole different creature. The Bible talks about us being a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God. I've talked to people and they said, I'd die for my Savior. And I remind them, the Lord don't want us to die for him. He wants us to live for him. He wants us to live for him. Ephesians chapter 4 and verse number 29 he talks about this very thing. Uh, I didn't put that verse in there, but let me read you this verse. He, he talks about, let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth. And, and that corrupt means rotten or foul. But he goes on to say, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearers. And, and then he talks about, behold also the ships. Now he talks about the ships here in the, in the, in the verse number four which though they are so great are driven with fierce winds and yet they're turned about with very small helm whithersoever the governor listed. A ship, helm, or rudder will control the whole course of that entire ship even though it's small. Even through difficult circumstances that rudder and the helmsman can control that big old vessel. Psalmist said it this way, I said I will take heed to my ways. I sin not with my tongue. I will keep my mouth with a bridle while the wicked is before me. Your grandmother or your mother, like mine, probably told you, if you can't say something good about somebody, don't say anything at all. I said I, I need this probably as much as anybody here. Sometimes we make careless statements that wreck reputations, ruin friendships, damage marriages, destroy, destroy Christian witnesses. Or we can say the right things and build somebody up. I was up at the sheriff's office this morning, a guy come in and uh, had the privilege of saying something to him. And I watched it light him up. I was encouraging him. And he was telling me about somebody else. And he said, uh, I try to talk to him every day, preacher. I said, you do? He said, yeah, he's been 17 days without a drink. I said, where's he at? And he told me, I said, I'm going by there. Next time I'm down that way, several miles from here, I said, next time I'm by that way, I'm going to stop and tell him. I said, he said, I said, I won't mention you. He said, oh, you mentioned me. I said, no, I ain't got to mention you. I'm going to tell him that the word is spreading. That God's done something in his life. He, he's talking about he got right with God and he's, and he's sober. I said, I'm going to tell him the word is spreading that God's done something in his life. 
I say I encourage you. You see the power of the word. You see what I'm saying? The power of the word and the testimony. How, how encouraging that would be if all of us did that in people's lives. When you hear something good, you start spreading. Oh, now when we hear something bad now, what do we do? Did you hear about something? Uh-huh. But when we hear something good, why don't we do that? Hmm. Jesus said, Matthew chapter 12, verse 36, Every idle word that a man speak, that shall he give account in the day of judgment. For by the word thou shalt be justified, and by the words thou shalt be condemned. James said, Even so the tongue is a little member, and boasteth, boasteth great things. It means we can be gracious. Use that that tongue to do gracious things, beneficial things, proper use of the tongue. Last thing he says there in the, down in verse number five, he says what? He says in that proper use of the tongue, he says is that little, even so the tongue is a little member and boasteth great things, great things. Little member boasteth great things. You can do great things if you share the gospel. Do great things if you encourage somebody to do the right things. You can do great things if you what? Uh, Say the right things. Speak a word of encouragement and love to a person. Maybe there's somebody tonight you need to go home and call and encourage them. Or maybe there's somebody tonight you need to call and share the gospel with. Remind them you're praying for them. Use your tongue properly. God help us to properly use our tongues generously, gently, and graciously as James has reminded us tonight. Father, I want to thank you for the truth of your word. I want to thank you, Lord, how you're showing us different things here. Uh, Lord, from your word that's even relevant for our day, our lives, even this very moment. Help us, Lord. Help me. Oh, my. I want to thank you for convicting my heart. Thank you that you still speak to my heart. Thank you, Lord, that your word comes alive. And, Lord, the reminder of what you do, how you do it in all of our lives. Help us, Lord, to be a light for you everywhere we go. We lift you up. Lord, you said if we lift you up, you draw all men unto you. Help us, Lord, to do that very thing. In Jesus' wonderful name, amen.